All right, uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 8. Um, this is kind of right where we picked up last time, uh, where we were last Thursday night. We ended in verse 7, we'll pick up in verse 8, read a few verses and jump right into our lesson and you can follow along in your notes here tonight. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And what and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now, the theme of the lesson, as you can see, as we've read in these few verses, is light. Light is mentioned five times just in those few verses that we read here tonight. And I'll be honest with you, as I study the book of Ephesians, specifically chapter 5, I see chapter 5 as one of the most practical chapters in all of the New Testament. I, I would put it uh, in the same category as I would in Romans chapter 12, which is uh, right when Paul starts, after those parenthetical chapters, starts into the practicality of the book of Romans. But not only is it practical, as you read just by reading the text, it's very pointed, very pointed. I never want it to seem, as even as we read the text, I'm preaching, always preaching against sin or being negative all the time, but sometimes the text will lead itself that way. But sometimes as you're going through a particular passage, God will use the scriptures and speak to our hearts because he loves us and show us things because he loves us. Also, if you're walking in the light, you have no problem with anything that you read in a text or that the preacher is going to deliver as long as it is doctrinally sound. If you have areas that aren't right with God, then the Holy Spirit will take the light of the Word of God and expose those things in our lives so we can get them right. And be honest with you, I'm thankful for that. How about you? In essence, he's not just going to leave us to our own devices. He's going to use the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to speak to us and to reprove us and to rebuke us where we need it. I remember uh, Pastor Blue preaching some messages, one that stands out specifically. He preached a message titled, Kisses Without Conviction. I probably listened to it 10 times. It was just a, you know, it's one of those messages where basically it rips your face off. <laughs> but sometimes that's exactly what we need. We could come to church every, every Sunday and just say, oh, God is all love, God is all good, you're okay, I'm okay, uh, just make sure you tithe. No, that's not what we, we're, we, we need to preach, the whole counsel of God. Amen. In grace, speak the truth in love, I understand that. Ephesians 5, look at verse 13. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. Now, the word manifest means to be brought forth. And one thing I can tell you for sure is that an unsaved world does not want the light exposed on what God calls their unfruitful works of darkness. Nor does a Christian that's not living right like it when a preacher gets up and sheds light on what they may be doing in secret. Usually they get mad at the preacher or find ways to justify how they're living instead of getting right with God. After all, the Bible does say in Proverbs 14, verse 14, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own devices. Now, let's take a few minutes, notice in your notes, and uh, look in our passage here, consider what the Holy Spirit might have in store for us uh, here this evening. First of all, we see this, right, taken from the passage, walk in the light. Walk in the light. 
interesting as we go through this passage, it really kind of ties in uh, Brother Brandon and, and Kylam and some of the others on, on Sunday night who were discussing uh, the light. And you'll see a lot of similarities to some of that here as we go through this passage here. Walk in the light, verse 8 and verse 9. You were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Notice the word, look at verse 8, notice what he says. For ye were, what's the next word? Now, what does the Holy Spirit mean by this? Now, we kind of touched briefly on it last week. It means at one time before, but not anymore. Uh, let, me, let me show you just an interesting verse. They'll have it behind me here just for time. But Ephesians 2.13, notice what it says. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And so you used to be this, but now you're not anymore. Before we were saved, we were in darkness. The thing about darkness is that you do not necessarily know that you are in darkness until the light is given. So I'll say that again. We don't always necessarily know that we're walking in darkness until the light is given. Let me have you look at a verse here. Go to Proverbs 4. Hold your place just real quick. I'll have you look at a few, but not a lot tonight. Go to Proverbs 4. I want everybody to turn there. Proverbs chapter 4. thing about darkness is that you do not necessarily know you're in darkness until the light is given. Now, does the Bible speak to that? Well, if Proverbs 4, look at verse 19. The way of the wicked is as what? Here it is. Here it is. They know not at what they stumble. Th think about that verse and, 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 and how sad it is. The way of the wicked is as dark. They don't even know what they're stumbling over. It's one thing to fall, and it's another thing to fall and not know what you tripped over. How many of you have ever stubbed your toe before? <laughs> Does it feel good? Man, I mean, it's, some of you have to repent after it happens, I'm sure. <laughs> but you know what? You usually know specifically what you stubbed your, t you, you know what you hit. You know, uh, the corner of the bed, a table, a door, something. You, you know. But God says those who walk, walk in darkness, they don't even know what they're stumbling, for, uh, uh, stumbling over. Now, I don't have this in my notes, and they don't have it upstairs, but I want you to look at one other, look at two passages. Just, just, just I want you to see this. Go to Isaiah 59 and go over to Acts 26. Give you a little picture here. Isaiah 59 and uh, sword drill time here, Isaiah 59 and Acts 26. Now, the reason I'm having you look at these parallel passages is, is very simple. It, it sheds light on what Paul's saying, and it gives us a picture and a greater picture of exactly how this takes place. Isaiah 59, if you're there, say amen. amen. Okay, look, look, look at, uh, let's see here, jump for verse 9, verse 9. Judgment is far from us, neither does justice overtake us. Here, watch this. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For, for brightness, but we walk in what? We grope for the wall like the blind. And we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in, uh, we are in desolate places and are dead men. Verse 11, we roar like bears and mourn, uh, soar, uh, soar, soar like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but it's far from us. Now, this is Israel in the church age where the veil is totally blinding them here. They don't understand it, but it's also practically speaking, somebody who uh, is living out of the will of God or an unsaved person, they don't even know what they are tripping over. Groping is the word the Bible, use. it, the Bible uses in darkness. 
Now, if you're saved, you've been translated. Look at Acts 26. One of my favorite verses in all the New Testament. Look at Acts 26. If you're saved, ye are the children of light. That's what, that's what God says. If you're saved, you are the children of light. It's a blessing. I'd rather be a child of light than a child of darkness. Notice Acts 26 and verse 18. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to what? And from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. What a blessing. You know what you are? You're translated. Translated? Transla translated from the power of darkness, that's the kingdom of Satan, translated into the kingdom of his dear son. That my my friends, is a blessing. Now, Paul, go, Paul goes on to say, go back to Ephesians 5, now that you are light in the Lord, we should therefore, therefore, we walk as children of light by following Jesus. Now, you're, you're back in verse, you're back in Ephesians 5. Notice, we are to follow. We are to follow. Now, Keep in mind, we're, we're to follow Christ. We know that. We are light in the Lord. We are to walk as children of life by following Jesus. Now, keep in mind, not imitating, following. Don't, don't miss that. A lot of the new Bibles change the word, and they change the word to imitating. You're not to imitate, you're to follow. And I don't have time to get into all of the nuances and why that is so important, uh, and what the difference is, but just trust me on that, and, and I'll teach it at another time. Um, so what are some of the benefits of walking in the light? John chapter 8 and verse 12 says this, he that, this is Jesus, John 8, 12, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. Now, I'm a little bit of a simpleton in, in, in this sense. When, if Jesus says this, if he says, um, if you follow me, you're not going to walk in darkness. Sign me up. That's what, uh, how many of you want to walk in darkness? <laughs> Nobody. Well, Jesus said, if you follow me, you're not going to be in darkness. It, it, we overcomplicate it. We overcomplicate it. You say, can Christians walk in darkness? Absolutely, when they close the, when they close the light. So, I don't know about you, but I don't want to walk in darkness. And... That verse really isn't convoluted at all. He that followeth in me shall not walk in darkness. That's all I need to do, and I will not stumble. Praise God. And so each day when you pray, Lord, help me to walk in the light. That simple. Follow him. Another benefit. 1 John 1, 7. Watch this. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have what? fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. So if you follow Jesus, you don't walk in darkness. If you follow Jesus and we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. I'd say that's quite a benefit. Let me ask the church tonight. It's midweek service. It's Bible study night. I like to have a little interaction. What if we were saved? Here's my question. What if we're saved and we refuse to walk in the light? Okay? What happens? So you're saved. If you're saved tonight, say amen. amen. You're saved. Okay? You know you're saved. What if, for whatever reason, okay, we close our Bibles? We get out of prayer. We might be in church physically, but we're not there spiritually. We're just kind of going through the motions. What happens if we refuse to walk in the light? Walk me through. What happens if we, if we do that? And, okay, uh, Rosie? We grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieve the Holy Spirit, absolutely. For the killing back. We reap what we sow. <laughs> it's very true. Last I heard, it's an irrefutable principle. 
Electa. Volunteer our prayer. Yeah, that, 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 I don't want to get going on that, but this is not a popular teaching, but it's true. I'm going to repeat it for those online and for those of you who didn't hear it. If we get out of the will of God and we live in sin or we have unrepentant sin, I mean, this is hard for me not to preach on. First of all, you have Psalm 68, 11. If I, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Well, you say, what do you mean? I can pray all the time. Yes, you can. But if you live an unrepentant lifestyle and you don't walk in the light and you're regarding iniquity in your heart, the Lord is not, you have something blocking. You're saved yet so as by fire, but you can pray about everything to your blue in the face. He wants you to repent and get right. So that's a very, very, very uh, important one. All right, somebody else. What happens? Your Sandy? joy is gone. Yeah, that's right in my notes. You got it. You're, hey, I'll, but I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on it. You don't walk in, you don't, if I don't walk in the light as he is in the light, and if I close my Bible and I get out of prayer, you know what, you know what I lose? I lose my joy. And there's very few things that are worse than losing your joy because you're just defeated. You're defeated. Okay, that's good. Somebody else, Diane? You lose your influence. You lose your influence, your testimony. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we are the, we are the uh, examples of Christ known and written, the epistles of Christ known and read of all men, and they're reading us, and your testimony can be silenced. Brother Meek? You don't bear any fruit. No fruit. Well, you, you do, it's just the wrong kind, right? <laughs> Very good. You bear no fruit for God. Absolutely true. All right, very, these are great. Somebody else, what else? Tom? Yeah, Elise Moyes is taking phony baloney seriously. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good one. Anybody else? What happens? Anna? Darkness takes over? Darkness takes over. Yep, absolutely. Connie? You'll be spiritually weak. <coughs> spiritually weak. Spiritually weak. Oh, weak, absolutely. Yeah, I thought you were saying that in Tagalog. I, I couldn't. <laughs> Sorry. Spiritually weak. Floyd, Rosemary. We won't grow spiritually. Not at all. Tie in together. Anemic. Anemic. Matter of fact, my, my dad sent me this today, and it said, if you're not spiritually fed, you will be emotionally led. Yeah. Very good. He said, possibly attributed to K.S. Murphy, but I'm not sure, right? Uh, maybe one more, Brother Adam. Become unthankful. You become unthankful, yes. You lose your discernment. You lose discernment. You start making bad decisions. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, and that can, and by the way, we're not just talking about people in the world, and reprobates, or, I'm talking about this can happen to all of us. Pastor Blue preached a message years ago on uh, what we can lose um, when we backslide. And uh, it, there's a lot there. And so that is why Paul says, look back at it, you're open to it, walk in the light. You are the children of light, walk in the light. I wrote down, your joy goes away. Sandy had that one. How, nobody mentioned this one. Your security of salvation. Hey, your assurance is gone. If you don't live right, you don't have the wonderful assurance of salvation, knowing that you're saved. It's like, you know, I think I'm saved. I hope I am. Well, I know it says that, but inside, you don't have that assurance. Your fellowship with the other children of light will disappear. You're, you walk back into darkness. Somebody mentioned that. And one other one I didn't hear anybody mention is this. When you don't walk in the light, one of the things we jeopardize is we lose the blessing of God in our lives. We, we lose, it's kind of like this. If you have a child and your child walks down the path of disobedience, you don't, I mean, you still love them, absolutely, but you don't say to go, hey, uh, can I give this to you? And I want to do this for you. And I want to do this for you. And I want to do this for you. Let me give this to you. No, no, no. You're not rewarding bad behavior, Right? Well, do you think our Father in heaven who sees us, if we don't walk in the light, he's going to, let me bless you. I'm going to pour out, open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you aren't even able to receive because you've been so disobedient. He doesn't do that. 
Matter of fact, he says in Psalm 84, verse 11, nothing good will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Number two, notice in your notes, to prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. Verse 10. Now, there's some clear ways that we can prove what is acceptable to the Lord, okay? Um, let me just quickly, I, I didn't have this in my notes, but I'm going to ask you just, just very quick, not as long as the last one. What, in your perspective, how do you think, you're sitting here tonight, midweek Bible study, January 4th, 2024, how can you prove what's acceptable to the Lord? Just quicker ones here, real quick. I know it's a, a fast one, but read this. Read the book. Okay, somebody else? Trust yeah. Hard times. Absolutely, very good. Follow his commandments. Follow his commandments. How do you prove what's acceptable to the Lord? Rosemary. Obey. Obey, yes. Okay, all right. Now look at the verse again. Proving, in the context here, based on verses 8 and 9, what is acceptable unto the Lord? I wrote this down. Some ways to do it. When it's, when it's a decision, let's so, say, so for example, you're, you, maybe you're in an area and you're like, I'm not sure if this is right. How, how can I say it like this? Hey, I wonder if this is acceptable. Is, Lord, is, is, is what I'm doing acceptable here? How do I prove that? Ask yourself the question, is it biblical? Number two, do I have a conscience against it? Number three, is what I'm going to do or doing cause another brother to stumble? God doesn't try to hide things from us. That's why he gave us his word. That's why we have a divine interpreter, the Holy Spirit. That is why he gave us pastors to be able to preach and teach the word of God and expound on the word, word of God. Prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. You know what prove means? Prove means to test something. Jesus, uh, God said in, in Malachi chapter three, he said, prove me. He said, prove me. Okay. Look at Romans 12. Turn over there if you would. Just Romans chapter 12. Hold your place in Ephesians 5. Look at Romans 12. You turn fast. I'll read fast. And we'll be right on time. Romans 12. Everybody in here probably has this memorized. But I want us to see it anyway. Romans 12. I'm going to give you another way to prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Watch this. And be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may what? Prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is my wife's life verse, Romans 12, 1 and 2. So prove means to test. He says, prove what's acceptable to the Lord. How do you do that? Well, present your body. Uh, don't be conformed to this world. If you're conformed to this world, you're not going to be able to prove what's acceptable to the Lord and then be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to prove what's, uh, what is good and what is acceptable in the perfect will of God. You will never prove what is acceptable to the Lord if you're conformed to the world. Thirdly, notice in your notes, thirdly, avoid the darkness. Avoid the darkness. <laughs> now, tell me if this is convoluted or it's hard to figure out what God means. Verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You know what that means? Look over here for just a minute. That means that there are people that are doing things in darkness that are unfruitful. They don't bear fruit. He says, here's the kicker. He says, not only don't have fellowship with them, here's the hard part. We're going to talk a, a minute about this tonight, but I want you to reprove them. Whew. That can be a challenge. Now, that couldn't be more direct. You cannot walk in the light. You cannot walk in the light and have fellowship with darkness. C can I say tonight, that is absolutely impossible to do. You can think you're doing it, but if you are walking in darkness, you're not having fellowship with your creator. 
That, that's for sure. Let, let me share, you, share a verse with you. Notice behind me, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? He goes on to say, what concord hath Christ with Belial? Notice it's not just the people associated with darkness. Well, that goes without saying. I'll just say to the church, we are not to fellowship with uh, those that are associated with unfruitful works of darkness. That doesn't mean you don't witness. It doesn't mean you don't invite them to church. It doesn't mean you don't bring something over to their home. It doesn't mean that you don't help them. It means to spend time. How can two walk together except they be agreed? Look again at verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. As children of the light, we are not to be associated with what they do. What they do. We are commanded to come away from that. Verse 17. Notice behind me, verse 17. Watch this. God says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Today, some Christians want to blur the lines. May I say tonight that there are no shades of gray with God, period. You ever thought about that? I mean, have you actually pondered that? Literally given it thought? Because so many Christians want to blur the lines. The last I checked... It's heaven or hell, saved or lost, right or wrong. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. You, there is absolutely no shades of gray with God. But here's the hard part. This is the hard part. Look at the end of verse 11. Not only do you not have fellowship with those with unfruitful word of darkness, but you are to reprove them. This is where the trouble starts. God says, if you see darkness, you're to reprove it. The word reprove means to reprimand. So <laughs> nobody wants to be that one that goes around reprimanding everybody for not doing right. How would you like my job? And I, I win a lot of friends from this lectern right here. You know what God tells the preacher? He tells the preacher to preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Even when you don't want to preach the word, he says, preach the word. Maybe you're out of season. Maybe you're just kind of not feeling it. I still have a job to do. Pastor Kennedy always tells me, I said, you know, I just, I, I wish I felt it more in here. He says, sometimes you need to throw your flesh down and get up there and just preach the Bible. Yes, sir. And he helps me. Encur I mean that. He encourages me. My job is to preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke. I don't like to, do, I don't get any sadistic satisfaction out of coming with a heavy message and a big old sharp stick to poke, pe poke people's eyes out. I don't like that, but it's my job. And it's very hard in these days because, you know, you know, I want people to like me. <laughs> <laughs> but he does say exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And that's why you just have patience Listen, if, if there's people that are in your church and they're not living right, you love them. Christ said, I travail in pain together with you. Travail until Christ be formed in you. It takes time. Uh, Brother Adam gave a great testimony when we were driving in the, in the, um, in the bus up to knock on Sawan. A great testimony about really, I didn't even know the whole full story about when they first started coming, Dr. Pass and I were teaching Sunday school 25 years ago over in the education building, and he gave me his testimony about how his knee was blown out and this and that, and his wife, you know, just things he was going through that God was trying to get his attention. And I remember thinking at the very beginning, he's not very faithful. But all of a sudden, I mean, he, they got it. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Thursday night, 
but God got, God got a hold of his attention. I, by, by the way, you ought to share that testimony the next time you come up here. It'd be great for the church to hear. Now, preach the word. So where, where, where Ephesians 5. Don't fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Jesus certainly did that, didn't he? Paul did that on a regular basis. Remember the things that he said to people? Uh, Jesus, remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees? It was the religious crowd. Oh, you generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. He told the Pharisees, he says, you hypocrites. He says, whited sepulchers. You're full of extortion in excess. I mean, you preach that on a Sunday morning. Us four no more. John the Baptist reproved and it cost him his head. Remember Herod and Herodias and the uh, immorality that took place? And he absolutely unscathingly just, if that's a word, just nailed it. So that is why many just keep quiet. You know why? It's a little bit easier just not to say anything, but yet we're cold. It says, if your children are light, don't have, unfru- don't have fellowship with unfruitful words or darkness, but rather reprove them. You're to say something. You know, the world says, see something, say something. Well, so the Christian's supposed to do that as well. Notice in next verse, verse 12, we're almost done. Verse 12, again, staying on the same thing of reproving the darkness. Verse 12, for it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But rather, uh, but, uh, but all things that are reproved, there it is again, made manifest by the light. Verse 12 is, is self-explanatory. There is so much debauchery taking place in this world. We're told it's a shame to even talk about it. I mean, just again, Pauline epistles, this dispensation, God is saying to you and me, we are not even to speak of those things which are done in secret. And with all due respect, I, I've taken criticism for this before. Um, I, a matter of fact, I got an email from a lady years ago. Um, and so don't misunderstand. I want to be careful when I say it because I don't want to offend people. But when I make the statement, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said in his book, Lectures to My Students, which by the way, I encourage you to read that book. It's an excellent book. Uh, another good book I'm reading right now is The Boys in the Boat. If you haven't read that book, I encourage you to read that. But um, Lectures to My Students, Spurgeon said, as he's training young preachers, he said, in the ministry, it's good to have two deaf ears and one blind eye. And and in essence, the less you know, the, it, it helps you just be able to preach and let the Spirit of God deal with it. That doesn't mean I don't care about the flock and want to know how I can be a help, but I, do not, I don't want to know four or 500 people what's going on in their lives. I don't want to know. And uh, that isn't because I don't care. I just want to be able to preach the Word of God and have it, uh, you know, reprove where needed. All right? Now, Keep in mind, discretion is the key. Not every person should be reproved. So, so don't miss that. No, well, I'm, the, I'm the reprover. I got it. I'm going to be the one. Well, not everybody needs to be reproved. Does anybody know why not everybody should be reproved? Anybody know why? This is a Bible quiz. Anybody know why? Diane? Good job. It's pretty close. Proverbs 9. He that reproveth a scorner getteth himself shame. Very good. And he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. So you don't, it's, you know, if they're scorners, if they are scorners, I, and I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I've had multiple through 20 years, uh, 20, almost 25 years of ministry, multiple times that I've had, that I've tried to reprove a scorner. I tried to rebuke a scorner and it never, and I just didn't apply the verse and it never worked out. You can, it tells you not to do it. Matter of fact, it's a shame if you do it. So keep in mind, those that are not walking in the light do not like you at all anyway. You say, well, how do you know that? But just for time, because I'm out of time. 
Pro- well, I know that, right? Proverbs 29, 27. An unjust man is an abomination to the just. And he that is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. If you walk uprightly and you are shining the light of Jesus Christ, you're an abomination to the wicked. You're an abomination to them. They don't like you. Lastly, awake to righteousness and embrace the light. Verse 14. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. Paul's talking to Christians who are asleep at the wheel. He says, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. Churches are filled with Christians who are in church physically, but dead spiritually. There's no light in them. The church age is likened to nighttime. Therefore, we must walk as in the day. I'm reminded of Romans chapter 11. The Bible says that knowing that the time that is now high time to awake out of sleep, he says, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife or envy. Folks, We are called children of light. We are children of the day, not of the night. And if we're going to be effective in preaching the gospel, then we're going to have to do exactly what we heard tonight in some of the recommendations and suggestions when it came to how we're to share the light. I know one thing. Psalm 119, verse 130 says, the entrance of thy word giveth light. The one thing I'll say about darkness is, darkness cannot run from the light. I mean, just picture the physical side of it. If I were to go back here, and I don't have any idea if the lights are on here, but if I were to take a flashlight, all the lights are on, and I just went like this, it's impossible for the light to run, excuse me, for the darkness to run. And that's what, it exposes the darkness. And when we walk as children of light, just your testimony alone is a, uh, it exposes and reproves those around you just by walking uprightly. And the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel, who's the image of Christ, should shine unto them that they should be saved. And how is he gonna do that? He's gonna do that through you and I as we, allow the light to shine through us. Wasn't it Jesus that said in Matthew 5, 16, um, you're the light of this world, the light. So best response to all of that is the darker the night, the brighter the light. And so it doesn't take much in today's day and age. All right.